there we go. Welcome everybody. It's uh, good to see everyone from uh, many parts of Europe this morning for the first webinar of this year's European Distance Learning Week. Um, the European Distance Learning Week is full of very interesting webinars that are arranged jointly by EDEM, the European Distance and E-Learning Network, and the American equivalent USDLA. So it's a transatlantic uh, cooperation. This webinar, uh, the web, the, you'll all get, everyone who's registered will be getting the link to the recording afterwards and you can, you can stop and start it as you like. Just to say that you have, uh, you have chat rights and you will be asking you to do a lot of chatting during this session. It's going to be as interactive as we can make it, but only the speakers, the, the invited speakers have video and audio rights, just to make, let you know that. So, my name is Alistair Creelman. As you can see on the map, I am in the southeast corner of Sweden at uh, Linnaeus University in Kalmar. And it is uh, a privilege to, in, to in, introduce you to two of our, our two guest speakers for today. And we're going to be talking about the future of openness or a crisis for openness. Where do we go from here? And uh, I'd just like you to introduce yourselves briefly, Catherine. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's wonderful to be here and to see you all. Some familiar faces and some not so familiar faces. Um, my, uh, as I said, my name is Catherine Cronin and I'm based in Ireland. I'm speaking from my kitchen today in Ireland in Galway on the West Coast. And up until two weeks ago, I was working at the National University of Ireland in Galway, um, where I recently completed my PhD in the area of open educational practices and how they are used and not used in higher education. Um, but last week I started a new position as a strategic education developer at what's called our National Forum in Ireland for the Enhancement of Teaching and Learning in Higher Education. And that is a, a neutral, academic-led body, small group of people that fosters collaboration across higher education in Ireland. So. Um, I can answer a few questions about that, but I really just started looking forward to the challenge, um, but mostly really looking forward to the conversation here this morning with you all. And Martin? I'm Martin Weller. I'm a professor of educational technology at the Open University, and I'm, I'm a contrast to Catherine where she's in a new job for two weeks. I've been in the same job for 24 years. <laughs> well, not exactly the same job, but in the same place. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I run a, a research unit called the OER Hub, uh, and we do lots of research on things like OER, MOOCs, open access, those kind of things. Um, and I'm particularly interested in digital scholarship and open scholarship. So looking forward to the chat today. Okay, and the wonders of um, social media networking uh, that we all are part of is the fact that I've, I've followed Martin and Catherine for a long time and have had interaction via various social media, but this is the first time I've actually seen them actually face to face or moving. And uh, it feels, you know, you, you feel you know someone and then you realize you've never actually met them. So that's a, a little bit of a, a wonder here. However, the theme for today's uh, the webinar is about openness. And all of us, I think, are very familiar with uh, open education. We make open education resources. We share them. We are involved in various types of open courses. However, I felt really in the last two years there's been a bit of a crisis because uh, again and again, almost monthly, there are new sort of scandals or problems with some of the platforms that we know and love and have become rather dependent on, and we find out that, uh, well, they're not really, we didn't realize what they were doing with our data, or we should have realized. Um, where, do we put our, where do we put our information when so many of the channels are highly commercial? And where is it, where does that, where do we have to find our own tools for things, or can we continue to use those commercial platforms? Some of these questions were in my head, and I think we'll get some insights into that from Martin and Catherine. Before we do that, however, I want to get a little bit of input from you. So I'm going to change the view here. And I'm going to share my screen. Now, 
I hope you can see my screen. And uh, what barriers to openness do you see today? And if you go to www.menti.com, you can do that on your mobile or you can open a new uh, tab in your web browser and go to that site, menti.com, use the code 922686 and just write a few words that come to mind. What barriers to openness do you see today? And it'll take a little bit of time to... Uh... Ah, thanks Gabby for the for putting it out on the in the chat, the link directly. We've already got an answer there, GDPR. Mm. <laughs> Is it a barrier? Is it an opportunity? Lack of culture? Well, Catherine's getting her um, glass of water. Martin, you're welcome to comment. Uh, I wonder if it's the lack of culture, a lack of uh, culture around openness. Is that what I think? Two, two for GDPR. It's interesting. Yes, it's interesting that GDPR, and I think um, both Catherine and I will touch upon this. It, it kind of, that kind of gets to one of the kind of paradoxes about openness in some ways. In some ways, it's a good thing. You know, it's about they're trying to protect your privacy and your data and those kind of things. But at the same time, it does restrict what you can do. Um, and a lot of things we used to just do openly and, you know, not worry about these things it suddenly become, as Alistair was saying, like, you know, you've got to make sure that all these things are, are, are GDPR compliant. Um, any reactions, Catherine, on the comments coming up? Yes, I'm just thinking that these, they, a lot of them point to just the need for us as individuals and as educators to be constantly educating ourselves about, you know, these kinds of developments and risks and everything. So that's, you know, there are the benefits of openness, but this is added work, if you like, in terms of doing openness well and safely, you know, for ourselves and our students. I also think things like GDPR often become an excuse for people that they say, I'd like to do it, but GDPR, you know, it's like, <laughs> so they just like, without actually knowing what it means, it just like becomes an excuse not to do these things. Indeed. Another dreaded four-letter <laughs> acronym. <laughs> so, yeah, so it's, that's what Anna's saying. So, uh, some use Mike? GDPR now as an excuse to stay close to the material. They've never been open yet. Exactly, Anna. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And language, somebody has written there, which I quite, I think, uh, mm -hmm. I assume you mean the lack of langu linguistic diversity. Mm. But that's only a guess. The fact that the overwhelming amount of uh, open OERs and open courses are in English. Someone's got the, the, the dreaded neoliberalism <laughs> phrases, and <laughs> I think basically we can just blame we can blame neoliberalism for everything, <laughs> can't we? I mean, it's <laughs> I've just been reading a PhD thesis about neoliberalism and open access. So it's... Interesting. But, uh, lack of understanding. Yeah. Mm. Irrationally sharing everything. Have we gone over I think we all we all know people who do do that. <laughs> <laughs> the the oversharers. Yeah, everything, yeah. everywhere, all the time. Okay, I think I will uh, return to. You're welcome to keep adding to it. I'll try and uh, I'll try and put that. Uh, I'll put the results up somewhere once I get some time to look at it. Uh, thank you for some input there, and that leads us quite nicely into uh, mm -hmm. Catherine, who is going to kick <coughs> off with some input. After Catherine's input, you'll get plenty of time for to discuss and uh, ask questions and remark, and you'll do that in the chat, but uh, for the next 10 minutes or so, it's mostly Catherine speaking. You can think of your questions and remarks as she is doing so. So the floor is yours, Catherine. Okay, thank you so much. Um, this uh, thought this might go somewhere near the beginning, but um, basically we've already done our introductions um, about ourselves. And in terms of uh, my presentation and Martin's presentation, I my presentation will be a short one. And what I am hoping to do is just to pose some ideas as a way in. 
um, and an avenue for thinking about openness, in a, in a sense, um, in, the, in, co in the context of the current challenges that we've all been talking about. So um, this slide I, I have used before. I, many, many people struggle with not only the definition of open education, but the definition of open. And I'm sure many of you who are in this webinar engage in these kinds of discussions yourselves with, with people. Um, but a couple of things I think that are, that are important, not so much in converging on a definition, but really recognizing some of these, these key features. And the first is that open, of course, is not universally experienced. So um, open practices mediated by many of the things that have already come up now in, in that initial um, poll. So it's mediated, of course, by geographic location, our institutional location, perhaps our discipline, um, and also by um, factors such as gender and race and personal circumstances. And these factors tend to operate together. So choices about openness that we may feel um, are positive, um, are, may not be positive for you know, all of our peers or all of our students. So we have to navigate that in some way. Um, that recognition can help us um, figure out how to navigate that. Um, so it's complex, of course. It requires digital capability and agency, certainly. Um, another feature that I think is useful to think about is the notion that openness is both descriptive and aspirational. So when we're talking about a particular resource, open educational resource, or a license, we're describing how open it is. But when we're discussing openness in the context of values or even practices, um, open is often aspirational. So we talk about things that might be increasingly open or open in specific contexts. Um, so again, we're getting away from the, the notion of open as a binary and, and the opposite of closed. And critical discourse is the piece that I'd like to say more about um, in, in my few minutes this morning. Um, but the quote I included from Tracy McMillan Cottom at the end there, I think is, is possibly most important, and that is that we, the open movement and our understanding of open education is moving um, beyond open access, which admittedly is important but is not sufficient. So we're moving from access to equity and justice. So when openness is under threat, the kinds of things we're talking about today, we don't just mean that people cannot access um, educational resources. We mean that equality um, is often under threat. So, um, so this is, this is a, a, a vitally important discussion, um, I think. So what can we do uh, in our respective locations as educators, as learning technologists, as leaders um, in various contexts? Um, one of the things I feel is very important is the need to develop networks and tools that help us to look really beneath the latest developments and the latest you know, article that we read about the latest scares and really to develop um, a critical approach to openness, um, as mentioned here. And this is possibly the... Um, the aspect of openness that I, that people ask me about the most or that I engage in, in the most discussions about. And certainly critical approaches to openness is an area that I think many of the people here in this session are working in. Um, it's becoming more of a topic of conversation in conferences about open education. Um, but defining what we mean by critical approaches I think is important for people who aren't engaged in that work. So the way that I have have found useful to describe it is that there are really two aspects of, of criticality um, when I talk about critical approaches. And one is a critical disposition. And the, this, the full quote by Michael Apple um, I have here, it's, which I think is wonderful. Michael Apple says that our task as educators requires criticism of what exists, restoring what is being lost, pointing towards possible futures, and sometimes it requires being criticized ourselves this being something we should yearn for since it signifies the mutuality and shifting roles of teachers and taught that we must um, enhance. And that is from a, a, a foreword to a book called The Politics of Education um, by Michael Apple. So that's probably the first aspect of criticality uh, that I would um, foreground. But the second is um, critical approaches to openness arise from a really critical theory. So critical theory is a focus, as it says here, on power and the operations of power and the rejection of all forms of oppression, injustice, and inequality. Now, that's a huge um, statement. But what that means for me with respect to openness is that if we use a critical approach, we ask questions 
um, in the face of the kinds of risks we spoke about um, at the start of this webinar. So things like who is defining openness, who is included, and who is excluded when education or, or a particular um, aspect of education is opened, and in what ways are people included and excluded. Um, we might also ask if specific open educational initiatives which have stated aims of fostering inclusivity and, and access and so on, if, if they actually achieve those aims. You know, do they actually enhance learning, foster inclusivity, um, and empower learners? And also, we must acknowledge that open education initiatives sometimes um, can do the opposite of what they intend to do, um, can actually further inequality rather than fostering equality. Um, so that is why I think this, the critical approach and the asking these questions is vitally important and having that kind of critical mindset. So in practice, uh, what does that mean? Um, well, firstly, I think it means um, developing our networks and our own reflective practice so that we are aware. But secondly, as, as educators, I think we can foster this in our, in our teaching, in our interactions with our peers and our students. So, um, as a couple of examples, um, a recent article by the wonderful um, scholar Zainab Chifetchi, um, is some of you may have read this, how social media took us from Tahrir Square to Donald Trump. So in this article, um, Zainab talks about um, that, that progression, which Martin is going to talk about more in a few minutes, about that progression from the, the heyday of openness and isn't it wonderful and isn't it liberatory to the issues we have now around surveillance and oppressive power and um, access and so on. So, you know, in this, in this article, she concludes that the way forward is to figure out how our institutions, our checks and balances, and our social safeguards should function in the 21st century, not just for digital technologies, but for politics and the economy in general. And she says, she concludes that by saying this responsible isn't on Russia or on Facebook or Google or Twitter alone, it is on us. So we are, you know, the agents of change in the context that we operate. So having the, these, the, the mindset to be reflective about our own practice and also to guide and model and help learners to develop those practices is also important. Um, another example of, of a resource um, which I think is, is useful. There are so many, but I wanted to highlight just a couple. Um, I was at the Mozilla Festival just over a week ago, MozFest, um, and I was in a session talking about the Internet Health Report. This was published for the first time last year, and it's going to be published every year. And it's a kind of um, open consultation about the health of the Internet, um, you know, what's positive and, and what issues do we have. And there are five areas it focuses on, and one of those five areas is openness. The others are um, inclusion, privacy and security, web literacy, et cetera. So we have wonderful resources that we can use as lenses um, to problematize and find ways forward through this, this rising tide of, of risks that we're aware of around working on the open web. And not only can we use that for our own reflective practice, but we can engage our students with resources like these. So an example of how I have done that recently is for the past few months, I was working with um, Mia Zamora in the US, Mahabali in Egypt, just pulling together what we're calling an emergent curriculum of um, equity-focused, open, connected resources. We knew we wanted to do this work with our students. Um, so we, you know, this, this resource is open and available for everyone. We started teaching using this curriculum in September, and many people have have um, added um, ideas and activities that, that have become part of the curriculum. So um, it, is true, it is truly open in that sense. Um, but one of the reflections that we had um, recently was that we thought initially, um, as Maha said, that this, the resources would be really useful for our students um, uh, directly, things like the, the article by Zainab Tefekci, the Internet Health Report. And they have been useful with students. But the most powerful impact has been for us in terms of being better teachers for our students. So in other words, um, not only sharing these resources, but invite, inviting conversation and difficult conversations often about these, these issues among, with our students, um, because we feel it is really important to help prepare them um, to, to deal with these issues um, as they go through education and beyond. 
So the final idea before uh, I hand over to Martin, and because I think probably the discussion period will be most useful for us, is my feeling is that um, I hope that those of us who are working in open, open education can engage in a, what I call a critical advocacy. So we recognize the benefits of openness on global, institutional, societal um, levels, but we're fully aware of the risks. And I hope that we'll be able to, to, to talk about the different, um, about openness as a, the differentness between openness as a value um, a, as an individual practice, because individuals navigate the tensions um, between the benefits and the risks of openness in their daily practice. And practices that may be very positive for us in the open terrain may be highly problematic and even dangerous for some of our students because they are marginalized in particular ways, not all of which are visible to us. So it needs great sensitivity and reflection on our part in order to practice openness um, well. And I think this, this notion of critical, uh, uh, having a critical approach um, helps us and equips us to do that. So particularly if we're educators, I think we have a responsibility to support learners in developing their skills and awareness um, to navigate the open web um, so that they can participate fully and safely and with confidence. So that's probably a lot um, all at once. But um, before I hand over to Martin, I, I, I expect we might have a, a time for discussion in between. But before I hand over to Martin, I just want to remind everyone that we um, the, the Open Education Community, one of our upcoming conferences is the OER conference, which this year will be held outside the UK for the first time uh, in Galway. That's OER 19. And the focus of the conference is critical and global perspectives. So the co-chairs of the conference are myself and Laura Chernewich, um, but the true organizers and hosts of the conference are ALT, the Association for Learning Technology. Um, so the title is Recentering Open, and that's really about acknowledging the fact that open is often centered on the perspectives of those with power and privilege. And we want to change that discussion to talk about recentering open on the perspectives of those on the margins um, in, in whatever ways that may be. Um, and then to conclude, um, I sent a message to Martin and Alistair with my slide saying that this would normally be a slide that I would include in a presentation such as this. Um, and I wasn't going to include it because I thought, well, Martin can speak for himself, but they, they both agreed that I could leave it in there at the end. Um, and Martin will, will expand on this more fully. But I think this really encapsulates so much of how we feel, um, but it's also quite empowering. So it's never been more risky to operate in the open, but it has also never been more vital to operate in the open because our culture is increasingly open, um, networked, and participatory. Um, and we um, need to engage in that. So that's all I have to say. Uh, and I'd love to open up the, the forum for questions or conversation. OK, thanks, Catherine. Uh, <coughs> now we can, uh, I've made the chat very large because it's over to you, please. Uh, some questions okay. already. We've got a, uh, Annika would like to hear more about the equality perspective, and Marcus was asking, what are your top five suggestions to move forward with open education in the sense you described it? So you can take one at a time. OK. Um, the equality perspective is, I mean, it's very interesting. One of the glossy headlines of, of of any kind of openness is that it can, you know, it can reduce barriers, it can increase equality. And I think one of the things we've learned over the last number of years is that um, at a personal level, specific open practices can actually increase inequality rather than equality. So for a very small example, you know, I'm, a I'm an open practitioner who has been open for some time. I started engaging in social networks when they were much less sinister and there was less surveillance and there was less of a role of you know capitalism and so on. So I built up my network and it was all very positive for me and now I have the benefit and beauty of that network um, in my work. So if I'm working with students now who are thinking about engaging in the open web, um, I cannot um, with good conscience ask them to you know just go create a Twitter account and let's have a conversation because Twitter is a very different place now than it was. So speaking from my standpoint, sure, it's very positive, and um, I, I have you know, a, a position um, in, my, in, in my work and um, in my field that allows me um, to use it in particular ways. 
But for someone who's marginalized in any number of ways, um, who's in one of my classes, that may not be the case. Um, and it could be in very simple ways. It could be I, I taught in IT for years, so it could be, you know, even asking students to contribute in a class or a cohort of students where very few of the students are 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 female um, in in an open forum. That's being marginalized. That's being very visible in particular ways. And of course, there are many many others. Um, in terms of the five suggestions, Marcus, that's quite a question, and I think you could probably um, you could you probably have um, some good suggestions there. Um, the, the first list that I showed has a lot of them, I think, um, helping, helping individuals to develop um, digital capabilities and agency um, and networks um, is key. Um, providing support at institutional level for those who want to engage in open practices in particular ways, you know, resources and support. Because one of the things I certainly found in my research was is where there is no policy or strategy around openness. Many individuals, both students and staff, feel that if they make a mistake, um, they, they will be in peril, um, that the university may not have their back, as they say. Um, so the absence of policy and the absence of strategy speaks very loudly to people within higher education institutions. Um, Martin, I'd like to open this up to you as well if you want to add anything here. Uh, um, I don't think this all pertains to what I have just said. Um, do you want to add anything? Um, I'd, I'd agree with everything you said. Um, I think Peter raised the point, you know, just do students demand openness? Um, if I'm getting the question right, I think that's an interesting point, actually. They they don't really, students don't come in onto campus or whatever, or onto online course saying, teach me how to be open. Um, and often they, they actively resist it. And I think that's understandable. Um, I've been a student myself recently. I took a... a MA in art history, which isn't my subject area at all, mm -hmm. and it really reminded me how how much learning is a vulnerable process. So you don't kind of, I think people want to feel safe. So like if you're forcing people to go out in the open, then it kind of exposes that vulnerability. Yes. But at the same time, I think getting a, as Catherine said, getting our students to under, develop those skills to be able to critically engage in this space is it is something we need to give almost like one of those graduate skills we need to develop now and on how to be a good network and how to yeah. make effective use of the network. Um, and so it, it's a tricky balance, I think. Cause lots of students, you know, don't think they need lots of skills, you know, mm -hmm. um, but, but, but but they do often, <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> students often don't like group work, for instance, but, you know, we know it's one of those skills that we can help develop them with. Yeah. Can I add one thing to that? So, do I have time, Alistair? Just one, just about that students demanding openness. That's, that's so interesting because you know, my perspective is that we, like like Martin said about this notion of graduate skills, um, we are um, helping to educate students to be not only professionals and engage in what a particular discipline they're in, but also citizens in an increasingly you know open, networked, and participatory culture. So, if the fears about surveillance or you know the risks of being online prevent people from engaging in that, then their voices will not be um, in that culture, and they cannot advocate for. Um, for what they believe in um, and what will help them and their communities. So I think it's vitally important and essential for higher education institutions to help students to develop those kind of network and open um, skills. Yeah, it's about helping them negotiate different layers of openness because uh, sometimes you're you want to be on a, a fairly low layer, and then other times you want you know how to how to move between them. It's not an it's not as you said it's not open or closed. It's many layers, and which layer is Indeed. appropriate for particular students at a particular time in a particular situation. Uh, Catherine can uh, continue to answer questions in the chat, actually, but I'm going to let uh, Martin uh, get started. I'll just move over back to the presentations. And Martin, uh, <coughs> it's your turn now. So off you go. OK, hi, everyone. Um, just first of all, if you hear some noise in the background, my dog's decided to start throwing his bone around on a hard floor, so, that's what the noise is. so it may sound like I'm in the middle of a building site. Uh, okay, yeah, so good. Um, when Alistair said, "Let's talk about it," kind of, you know, what now or, or the crisis in open education or open scholarship? Um, my approach to thinking about this was um, 
maybe a very academic one, is to is to start looking backward in a way. Um, so uh, in 2011, I wrote a book called uh, The Digital Scholar, which is open access if you want to read it. Um, and I think in many ways that could have been called the open scholar because it's really the kind of the, the openness that, that's the important part of that. You know, if you, uh, as a scholar, if you create your presentations in PowerPoint but just store them on your hard disk, it's, it's kind of, there's nothing interesting about the digital aspect of that. It's the, it's the openness that's interesting. Um, and so one thing I wanted to think about was you know, to think what, what's changed since then. Um, and at the time when we looked at it uh, around 2011, there'd been quite a lot of studies around 2010 looking at um, scholars, academics, educators, use of new technology, you know, Web 2.0 was, was still a, a, a usable term back then. Um, and in general, they all sort of found the same thing, really. So this, this study from Proctor Williams and Stewart said, uh, frequent or intensive use of new technologies is rare, and some researchers regard blogs, wikis, and other no novel forms of communication as a waste of time or even dangerous. So it was this whole kind of like approach with caution feeling at the at the time, um, and so for people like me, you know, I've, I've uh, been a blogger since two thousand and six, two thousand and five. I think um, I think the role I took and a lot of similar people was one of advocacy, really. You know, like you should get online; it's great. You know, everyone should start keeping a blog. You know, uh, you should all be on Twitter; it's going to change your life. And as Catherine was saying, that like, I think for those of us who are there early. Um, that being there early is, is a kind of a, a form of privilege in itself, um, and we kind of wanted other people to see that benefit. So, like, and I think we were probably guilty. Um, although I tried to sort of present a balanced view in that book, I think in general it was a kind of an advocacy book, um, and I think we were slightly guilty of glossing over some of the downsides. I think partic partly because. Um, we knew that people would jump on those straight away and say, so there, so like, like we're saying with GDPR in a way, so people go, oh, there we are. It's a bit bad. We don't need to think about this or engage with it at all. You know, sometimes getting academics or colleagues to engage with things that we think are useful uh, can be difficult. So at the time, um, I think that that was the kind of stance. So I wanted to kind of think about what's changed since then, so in, in the seven years since then. Uh, and in doing so, I, I sort of brought out five main themes, really. Um, and some conclusions at the end. So uh, the first of these is, um, in many ways, it's kind of become mainstream. So um, I mean, at the time, it was still slightly unusual. Sorry, it's my dog climbing off me. Uh, slightly unusual to meet an academic with a blog or a Twitter account, um, and that's not the case anymore. You know, I think that that's almost the norm. Um, and there's a, there was a study uh, recently in 2017. Um, where they found that online distance education enrollments were strong and mainly growing across universities. Existing institutions were increasing their online and distance education offerings, and there were many new institutions who were offering online distance education. So that whole kind of area of open online education has kind of really become part of the mainstream now, and also part of your mainstream practice as an individual. Uh, and, and related to that, there's been a, a, a shift to to open, I think, in many ways. And like I was saying, that book was called The Digital Scholar, and at the time we were, it was the digital part that we were excited about, but really it's, it's the open part now. So um, open has become a real modifier for many terms in, in education now. So we have open textbooks, open data, open pedagogy, open science, open educational practice, and so on. Um, so openness, as these seen like lots of large scale of recent developments, um, and I think the economist even declared recently that open versus closed is now replaced right versus left in, in kind of political discourse. So we've seen this kind of shift of openness becoming a, a kind of prominent discussion point in, in academia. Um, and again, sort of perhaps related to this is development of policy to kind of help that mainstream in a, in a way. So. Um, there's there's raw map which is the registry of open access repository mandates and policies and so it tracks uh, open access policies um, so in 2011 there were 387 such policies um, and there's 887 now in 68 different countries so there's been a kind of gradual if not radical uh, growth of policies um, so as well as open access publication mandates in many countries we also have uh, policies relating to open data um, uh, there's a European framework for digital competence, 
for educators, which says that for all educators, that a key skill is to be able to effectively find and identify resources. Uh, and UNESCO made OER a kind of central method for realizing their sustainable development goal. So we've seen kind of development of policy around openness and open practice and those kind of things. So that those first three, I think, kind of lay a kind of bedrock, if you like, for open practice within um, higher education. I think the other the kind of key area of interest, I think, that, that's developed is um, this idea of network identity, uh, or what uh, George Valencianos often calls network participatory scholarship, um, which is how academics use uh, social networks, he says, to pursue, share, reflect upon, critique, improve, validate, and further their scholarship. Um, and there's been some, uh, this is the area I think we, it's kind of richest for um, for research, so uh, people like Bonnie Stewart uh, and Catherine herself have written a lot on this. So, so Bonnie notes, for instance, that um, establishing a network identity increases visibility for pre-tenure academics, and this increased network and impact can offset some of those um, uh, effects of a kind of precarious academic labour. Um, Christina Costa is, is also written excellent stuff in this area. She talks about um, how sometimes the online culture and that network identity culture is at odds with the, the formal academic culture. And she talks about people having, uh, scholars having to adopt a, a, a double game, a strategy. We have to play both of those games in order to be effective. Um, so in some ways, it can be quite liberating. I think as Catherine was talking about, you know, I think, um, for instance, I've seen a lot of the good keynotes I see now aren't necessarily people with a strong publication record, but they're people with a very good online identity and who contribute a lot to the community. And I think that, in some ways, that is a quite a democratizing space. But at the same time, um, it's also an area that's become very negative. So uh, Bonnie again talks about you know network platforms are increasingly recognised as sites of rampant misogyny, racism, and, and harassment. So it's not the kind of friendly space that, that it once was, um, which I think leads on to my, my fifth um, point, which I think uh, Catherine covered uh, more, more effectively than I can. Which is I think we've, we have seen a kind of criticality of digital scholarship now and, and open scholarship. And I think this is in contrast to the kind of just pure advocacy that we saw uh, previously. So people are beginning to think like, you know, what's wrong with this, particularly in, in or, or what are the areas we need to be critical of and bring attention to, so things such as, you know, data, privacy, you know, uh, data capitalism, you know, um, political movements that are driven by uh, social media, fake news, all of those things. Um, and so that, that's been good to see. So I think uh, Catherine talked about the OER conference. So I've seen a real shift in that over the years from sort of basically, here's my OER project, isn't it great, which is you know very useful to kind of a much more critical approach of thinking about what does it mean to be open, uh, how can we improve this space, and those kind of things. Um, so I'll just quickly come on to some conclusions now. I hope we're doing for time. OK, yeah. Uh, so I think. It's fair to say that actually much is quite unchanged. <laughs> this is academia. We don't really go in for revolution so much. Um, and people have probably heard me before moan about the whole idea of disruption. It just basically, disruption is a really bad idea for technology. It just doesn't apply to our sector at all. Nearly all the examples of, of quite slow adoption. So although some things change, much is unchanged in, in how we go about education. Um, but there is a kind of picture of gradual acceptance. I remember when I uh, was doing this stuff, first of all, like first of all, I was told you, don't publish in online journals, which I don't think people would say now. Uh, but also, like, you know, um, why would you keep a blog? That's just a waste of time. Whereas now I get asked, oh, can you promote that thing on your blog or on your Twitter account? No. So, so people kind of accept that this is a, a valid part of um, an academic's profile in a way and not something to necessarily be sniffed at. Uh, but I think what you see is this kind of dialogue between traditional and open scholarship. It's not that, um, I think at the time, people, particularly those in the digital scholarship, open scholarship world, were sort of, it's going to be a revolution that's going to replace traditional scholarship. And I think it's, it's much more, we're beginning to see where they're complementary in a way. And I mentioned how, you know, um, having a good online network or uh, reputation and persona is leads to getting keynote speeches, for instance. So, and I think those kind of, how those things feed into each other is what we're seeing. So we're seeing how some processes in traditional scholarship uh, are being affected by open scholarship. So I think open access is a good one. Um, but also how, when you have research projects now trying to 
make sure that you're using different forms of dissemination to get that uh, the results out. Um, I, I do another talk sometime, uh, which is about the, the paradoxes of open scholarship, um, and it really that that's a way for me to kind of think about it. Like it, it's neither good nor bad now. If, if it was ever one or the other, um, so it's, things are true simultaneously. So it's true that it's both, for instance, it's both a democratizing space, but also at the same time, people who are disenfranchised uh, in in conventional space, if you like, are, are increasingly disenfranchised online. So both of those things are true simultaneously, and that's quite difficult to negotiate, I think. Uh, and there's a number of these paradoxes. Um, so I did a bit of research with uh, Katie Jordan. I say I did. Katie did most of that. Uh, with uh, Katie Jordan, uh, Viv Rolf, and Erwin De Vries, where, which grew out of a kind of conversation, uh, a conference we were having, where we're sort of being being grumpy old people, sort of complaining that um, people don't refer back to a lot of the other, a lot of the older open education stuff, particularly you know, when um, the open university model was being adopted uh, in the 70s, sort of globally. Um, there's a lot of work on, on pedagogy and uh, social implications of openness. Um, and we felt, we kind of felt this, but we weren't sure if it was true. So um, Katie's always at this stuff, and she did a citation analysis where she took a number of, so she did a, a search for open education, and then found all of the articles that they had, that had been referenced, and then uh, built up a kind of citation network spreading out from those, and then found the articles that those papers had referenced and so on. And this is the kind of like, um, Diagram that came out of that, and well, we've put these these uh, sectors on, but you can see that there's often it, it kind of really bore out what we'd thought, in, what we'd felt in many ways that um, these areas don't really talk to each other. So the MOOCs people don't really talk to the OER people. Obviously, don't talk to the, their papers. Don't really reference them much. Uh, open access publishing tends to be off to one side, uh, and there's some work around social media, uh, such as the the work by uh, George Vexiana, as I mentioned, and Bonnie Stewart. Um, but then over on the right, you see we've got distance education and open learning. So th that's very rarely mentioned in all of this history around open education. Uh, and open education schools is also a kind of uh, off on its own. So the, the one area that seems to be perhaps a kind of glue in bringing these things together is open educational practice. And maybe that's where we're moving to now, more of a focus around what does all this stuff mean for, for us in education? So I think trying to build bridges between these these, these sort of islands of, of expertise, islands of practice, would be a, a useful direction to go in. Um, so I've gonna, I'm going to end with a poll. Uh, I think Alistair needs to fire this one up. Um, so when I start, I, I think I'm going to ask, should we reward open scholarship? Um, so by reward, I mean you know, uh, give people promotion for it or credit for it and those kind of things. Uh, and the reason I'm asking this question, um, and perhaps I'm going to lead you on the answer here, is I think when I started out, so that thing about sort of five years ago or eight, seven, eight years ago, um, I think I, I would have always been a strong, you know, and I advocated very strongly that we should reward it, and I worked within the Open University to try and get the tenure and promotion uh, criteria changed to reward it. But the reason I guess I'm asking it as a question now is that by rewarding it, you're placing pressure on people to to, to play that game, as Christina Costa would put it. Um, so you're, you're forcing people to go online. So are you then forcing um, other academics and staff to have to deal with all that, all those kind of problems and the issues that, that Catherine was talking about? You know, um, about you know playing the, the the data capitalism game or open up to potential uh, abuse and harassment, those kind of things. Um, and so by saying we want to reward it, we're encouraging people to do it, but also are you then also forcing it? So that's my pitch about should we do it. I'll let the votes come in. Okay, interesting. So we added not an easy question in at the last minute. <laughs> so it was just going to be yes or no. Um, but I think that I think it's interesting. I think it, had we done this with this audience, sort of five, six years ago, I think the yeses would have been pretty much a hundred percent. But I think that the fact that not an easy question is is also getting quite a lot of votes. Um, I think people, are, you know, there's a reluctance to say no, we shouldn't. But I think people are accepting the not an easy question. Sort of hints at the 
the complexity around this thing, I think. Uh, okay, so I'll close the poll there. Um, so yes, all my photos are from Unsplash, which is why they look nice, not mine, uh, and up for discussion now. Okay, thanks Martin. Lots uh, to think about there. We'll just have a little bit of time if there are any questions in the chat there. Um, I think it's uh, the answer to your uh, poll was yes, but. <laughs> I was, I was, sorry, Martin, do you see a... I was just going to say, shall I dip in and answer some yeah. questions, or do you want to pull anything out? Uh, so Marcus asks, do you think academic culture and digital scholarship continues to play two unrelated games? I think the, the Venn diagram of the intersection is kind of increasing, if you like. So I think in some ways they, they often are different, uh, but I think increasingly people do see the benefits of them. Um, and I think, well, particularly where they're complementary. So you know, there's research that you know, if you have a good online identity, that helps with citations of papers. And having citations of papers is generally a good thing to have. You know, if it, if it increases your H index, or so you can help one play the other. I think. Um, but I, I do sometimes feel that there's a, a, a difference in culture. Sometimes you know, it's like that. I've, so. The blog culture, for instance, is very much about kind of informal and immediate, which is kind of totally different to the, the published journal kind of world, you know, which is kind of take your time to publish and use very precise language and those kind of things. So, but I think those two things can be complementary in a way, you know, so you can publish your paper, which no one understands, but then produce a nice sort of five minute video explaining it to, to the general public. So I, I think we're seeing a, more of an overlap between those. Yeah, there's a <coughs> Anna says she comes from a faculty with no gen, no understanding for open scholarship. I yeah. recognise that. Um, it's I think there are many places where there is very little understanding of that. Uh, so when local initiatives come up, they aren't rewarded. Yeah. Okay. So um, I, th I think one of the things there is that. Academics in general are, can be quite competitive, I think. And so I always think if they start seeing that the person down the corridor is getting keynote invites because they have a good online <laughs> reputation and those kind of things, they think, oh, okay, it's worth pursuing this. In some ways, I think you, know, you can nudge people to that kind of behavior. Um, but by reward, I think, uh, so for instance, it's, it's a very small change, but we got the. Um, promotion criteria and you, know, you change to say um, you have to demonstrate excellence in research as evidenced by publication in um, academic journals or and this was the key bit or other forms of digital output or something it was something like that so, so it allows you to it gives you room to make the case you know that um, that this person's online reputation you know is worthy is or is equivalent to a kind of research process that happens in a journal. So, uh, some of you may know my colleague Tony Hurst, um, who keeps a you know an excellent blog, and it, he's, it totally operates in a completely different way to kind of a lot of conventional academic stuff. So he will find some open data, uh, play about with it in some tools, uh, present a kind of network analysis, post it up on his blog, and he'll do that like in a day. But he then he then won't follow up and write an article about it. So, um, but I think you can make a case with like o over a prolonged period that Tony's blogging activity represents scholarly activity that that should be rewarded. We need to move towards our close there. But Fabio has had a couple of questions there. Unless, okay, so th th that's one one for you there, Catherine. So oh, it's for Catherine. Yes, I think she's answered in the. Yes, well, there's two questions, I think. Um, one, Fabio, I just put a one-liner there, but you know that notion of critical um, advocacy, I think, is really powerful. And I think it means uh, moving away from the, the, the advocacy around openness, which, is, which you, you often see in, um, 
in some kind, some university training about branding yourself online, that kind of that kind of um, advocacy of openness, and moving more towards openness with a sensitivity to risks, particularly risks that are encountered um, at the hard edge of personal um, practices, um, and that it's a very individual and continually negotiated. Um, and I think going in with that awareness and sensitivity um, results in much better conversations and and much. Uh, more productive forms of openness for, for individuals. So I think we can advocate for openness at an institutional level wholeheartedly. Um, so th this, is, this, is the, this is the difference. But when we're work engaging with individuals, having a much more sensitive and person-centered um, acknowledgement um, of the risks. I wonder myself, is it time, given the fact that many of the commercial platforms that we use, I mean, Twitter's come up here, but Facebook groups, mm -hmm. Google Plus, and all these other places have been compromised more or less. Is it time to revisit uh, safe, trusted spaces for collaboration? Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. uh, we used to have Wiki Educator, Wikiversity, they're still there. Mm -hmm. Maybe is it time to, to, to rev them up again? Um, is it time to move to Mastodon instead of Twitter? Is it to, you know, should mm -hmm. we be moving towards trusted spaces for sharing rather than the compromised commercial sites? Alistair, uh, without answering your questions, I would just like to point out that that is a wonderful example of this continual negotiation that I often speak about. And that is, the, that is what being open is about, is, is that continual negotiation and actually modeling that for our students and any staff that we may be um, also working with. Because you know, there's no such thing as, you know, as flicking the switch of open and saying, these are my tools, these are my platforms, right? Um, so I think modeling that kind of, you know, that, that it's messy um, and that it's never fixed um, is really important. So, and I think it's a great question. And yes, I think we do need to be, use, um, use a broader suite of, of tools to enable us to be open and closed in different ways. Um, Lorna says, trusted for whom? And yes, indeed. I mean, <laughs> mm. who decides what's trusted? We, we have, who do you trust? It was, it and, was interesting. Uh, sorry, I, I, and that's the importance of, of, of our networks. Go ahead. No, sorry. Uh, just that you mentioned Mastodon. It's like, it was interesting um, last year when a few of us had a play with it. Um, just kind of get, go to a new uh, social network site and think, okay, knowing what we know now about how this stuff works, how do we want to start changing our behavior mm -hmm. that you can start with a blank slate, but with the kind of knowledge previously, we, we, when we were on Twitter, we didn't know how it was going to evolve. Um, and that, so you did see people, I think, sort of behaving differently on Mastodon. But having said that, I think Marcus Snakes makes the point, the network effect is crucial. So I've stopped using Mastodon because well, <laughs> everyone's on Twitter. It's like, and I've only got so many spaces I want to go to. So it, it is, it is a kind of very difficult thing to negotiate. I, mean, I do think, in some ways, the point that uh, Jim Groom and Alan Levine, that those people make about own, owning your own space, is important. That's something mm -hmm. we could probably help students with. So, uh, you know, domain of one's own. So, mm -hmm. so you can use third-party tools, but ultimately, you have your own space which you own and control. I think is important. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, yes. nearly time to wrap up here. I just want to move, uh, as you see, the, the chat continues. It's down in the top, bottom right corner. <laughs> it's just a little smaller. A little mm -hmm. fine finale here. How can we make opus and openness in education safer for students and teachers? And that's, that, that is really a lot of what Catherine and Martin were talking about, really. But mm -hmm. any practical ideas? What are you doing to try to be open but safely? or safer mm. and just uh, type your answers you can write a whole sentence mm -hmm. if you want just down here mm. you're welcome to comment Martin and Catherine as you see them Very much about critical skills. Yeah. Criteria for safe. 
<laughs> yeah. That's one of the things, isn't it? It's like I think things can become very quickly unsafe. It's very difficult to predict when that happens, I think, isn't it? We can all think of examples of people who've said something in one space, you know, and it's just kind of off the cuff comment to friends or whatever and gets put out more publicly and suddenly people are calling for their jobs and things. So I think it I think it's very difficult sometimes to kind of know where the boundaries sit around these things. I saw a nice little <coughs> meme of um recently where it was a Venn diagram and there were two totally unrelated circles and one was internet and the other was privacy. Mm. Yeah, that's right. And I mean and that's the thing is no so the more we encourage students to do this and staff, you're kind of you're forcing them to to give up privacy. And there may be people who really don't want to do that, you know, it's like but if you make mm -hmm. it impossible for them to participate without doing it, then you need to take responsibility for that. And sometimes we need to Yes and sometimes we need to construct I, I just, safer areas for the students to mm -hmm. to share in a protected place rather than letting them go out. Sorry, Catherine. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I, it, it, it's come up here about the digital literacies for students and teachers. I mean, that is key because um, certainly sometimes the people that wrestle most with um, work, dealing with how to protect their privacy in particular ways are ones that haven't developed the digital skills and capabilities to enable them to have different spaces to use for different things and even you know to make productive use of anonymity like you spoke about at the start of this webinar Alistair and that's all part of this notion of digital capabilities so that's that's just an essential foundation I think for all of this so I'm delighted to see it here and continual reflection absolutely okay we're getting up to the top of the hour, and I'd mm -hmm. just like to move on to wrap up. Uh, we'd like you to say some comments on today's webinar. It's a little bit of quick feedback. Uh, the chat's there as well. Down at the very bottom, there are some web links where you can pick up information about the OER 2019 conference, about the rest of this week's webinar program. Sign up for some more if you like this. And you can follow Catherine's website and Martin's blog and Catherine on Twitter. Just click and uh, go to them. Um, some final words of reflection. Uh, who wants to kick off, Martin or Catherine? How do we how do we put a full stop on this, <laughs> Martin? <laughs> I don't think I have any wise words of reflection. I, mean, I, I think in, in some ways we're at an interesting time. Aren't we? I think that's um, we've had the kind of initial flourish of enthusiasm around these things, and now we're seeing um, sort of some of the downsides and things. But I think it's, I mean, it, one possible response to that is just to go oh, sod this. <laughs> I'm out of it. I'm not going to engage in any of that kind of stuff. But I, you know. I think we also, you know, there are a lot of benefits for it, and and, and generally, you know, it it can be quite a positive thing. Um, but also, I, I would be loath to kind of just cede all that online space to to the Nazis. Let them let them have it, you know, the the trolls and the idiots. When it's kind of such a potentially rich space, but also I think there's a real duty on academics and people in education to be part of that space. So we, we can't ignore it. You know, it's like it's you know, with the with the president of the United States pretty much running the country by Twitter, then we can't say it doesn't affect you in your normal life. So there is a kind of duty in us to kind of participate in this, but it's a much more complex um, space with a, a set of issues around it now. But I think we, it's, it, perhaps even more now than when it was kind of all all good and fun, um, we need to engage with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Catherine? Yeah. Thanks. I, I I agree with all of that, Martin. That's yeah, it's very powerful. And um, you know, this notion of reflective practice and modeling that kind of messy reflective practice with our peers and our students, I think, is so important. And it's just another aspect of us being learners as well as teachers. So, and not none more so than navigating these kind of um, open spaces um, and helping students do the same. And the only the only other thing I would end with is just that I you know I'm despite all of the risks and um, challenges that we face, I'm just immensely hopeful and, and feel that this is, 
you know, it's so important that all of us are here in this space doing this work right now, because if we are not here, um, you know, with the experience that we have and the sensibilities that we have, you know, voicing what we are talking about today, um, then other voices will prevail. So um, just like it's so important in a civic sense to always vote, I think this is, you know, this is the work of openness just now, this kind of critical work. So I'm um, just delighted to be doing it with you all. Uh, it's a privilege. OK, uh, I would like to uh, thank everybody for being here. Uh, it's been, we've had loads of uh, good comments in the chat, which has been going excellently. And plenty to think about for the future. And as I said, plenty of webinars this week. If you have the time, if you can take some time from your daily work to, to jump into one of them, then please do so. I'd like to ask uh, the Secretariat of Eden to stop the recording now and 